Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Well, I'd like to, well, it's my privilege to um, welcome you all tonight. Tonight's a very special occasion. It's the first uh, um, webinar hosted by the Johannesburg branch of the SIMM. Um, and it's great uh, to have uh, James Keir and the UMS group uh, who will be doing tonight's talk. And a big thank you to them for coming in a short notice and helping out. So much appreciated. Without further ado, if I can introduce you to um, James. James is the Group Executive, Engineering Technical Services. Um, he joined the UMS Group in August 2018 as a Senior Technical uh, Services Manager uh, for METS. He was appointed to the UMS Group as the Group Executive, Engineer Technical Services in January 2019. Um, James will be giving us the talk. Uh, I'm going to cut his uh, CV a little bit short here and then just go and introduce uh, Mary McNabb, who's the Chief Operating Officer uh, for the UMS Group. Uh, he will be assisting James with the questions at the end. Um, Mary has been appointed with the UMS Group since January 2018 as the Managing Director for METS. And since November 2018, um, was appointed to the role of COO of the UMS Group. Um, he is responsible for growing the footprint of the UMS Group, METS Mining, METS Processing, and Shaft Sinkers business entities. Uh, Mary, Mary has a wealth of experience, and on that note, I'd like to hand over to James uh, and begin the presentation. Thank you very much to Mary and James for sponsoring tonight. Hello everyone, and thanks Andrew. Uh, thank you for joining us for this presentation. Uh, I am James Keir, Executive. Uh, sorry, Executive, as Andrew says, Executive Manager of uh, Technical Services at UMS. I will be doing the present presenting this evening and Murray McNabb will be doing the questions with me at the end. Please keep note of your questions and write or write them in the chat and then we will answer them towards the end. UMS through its shaft sinkers and METS divisions has over 60 years experience in designing and maintaining shafts. And I can say in our lifetime and we have seen rather a lot. So with that in mind, we going through this presentation of how to prolong the life of aging mine infrastructure with a focus on shafts and headgears and thus extending the operational life of a mine. Many mines in South Africa, especially in the gold sector, are reaching the end of their intended design life. In the current economic climate, there's no money to develop new shafts, so the existing infrastructure is being used longer than it was originally intended and as such, the infrastructure within them are being pushed way beyond what they originally intended. Just like humans, shafts need more attention and care as they get older. If you think of a mine shaft as a human spine, uh, if you break your spine, you're paralyzed. In a similar way, if you lose your main vertical shaft in a mine, the mine's life is over. Throughout this presentation, I'm going to be using a lot of analogies just to bring home the point. There are several reasons to work in a shaft. One is upgrades. However, upgrades only make sense in terms of the remaining ore body and mine life. There's no point in doing a major upgrade if you're not going to get return on that investment which puts you into maintenance. And again, then you ask the question, how much maintenance should we do in the shaft? How long does it need to last? And these are all investment decisions that need to be made up front. Life extension sort of ties in with upgrades. A lot of pillar extractions are starting to be done now. So you need to go into the shaft and install shaft uh, pillars, uh, uh, sorry, shaft towers. METS and shaft sinkers have actually just done one, um, completing it very recently and with great success. And also accident repairs. Not that we wish it happens, but sometimes things do break in the shaft and you need to repair them. 
throughout this presentation, we'll be going through a few examples of that. Then within the shaft, there are different areas of focus. There's the winders, the sheaves, the ropes, the conveyances. There's the geology of the shaft, which we're not going to go into this presentation. I'm no geologist. Uh, the structures, both in the shaft and in the headgear, piping and other services in the shaft, and others being your loading box, stations, your shaft bottoms, spillage arrangements, etc. All of these have large impacts on the operation of the shaft and can either aid you in meeting your production targets or hinder you and cost quite a lot to keep it going. As people age, they need to take greater care of themselves. It's more frequent checkups, checks ups with specialists and the, and the like. A mine is no different. As it gets older, you need to do more regular inspections. Unplanned events happen more frequently. It develops more of a character. Um, as you know, with old cars, they have their quirks. Mine is exactly the same. It develops a character and we, we kind of need to listen to what it's telling us through its life. And there are ways of doing that. Unfortunately, with the state of the industry and the churn that we have with people, a lot of this knowledge is not passed on. And it adds to the issues of maintaining the shaft because people don't know exactly where to look in a shaft. The loss of performance, um, you also don't notice straight away. You just realize one day that, hey, you can't jump over that log like you used to. It's exactly the same as a shaft. Slowly, slowly it degrades, but until you do a time motion study of it, you don't actually realize how much performance you've actually lost. It's essentially like a slow puncture. The reduction in performance is so slow that you don't notice it. Now this has consequences to the operation of the mine as a whole. Financial, there's a slow puncture, it's the percentage of the revenue each year to the other extreme, which is a, a major blowout, which is the loss of a shaft and anything in between. If you're not monitoring the shaft and the maintenance and all of these things, you don't actually pick up on this. In addition to the financial consequences, you've got reputational damage and potential to injury and loss of life through incidents that happen within the shaft. Performance loss is well known on trackless machines. We all know that an average life or an average life before overhaul is five years, and then after 10 years, replace it because you're not going to get peak performance. It is exactly the same with other mine infrastructure, albeit over different time frames. It's just not as, well, as apparent and not as well as un understood. So why are we in this situation? Many shafts were sunk a long time ago. Technology has advanced, Regulations have been updated and improved. As the mine kept up with the, the, the latest legislation and components themselves, even if you look after them exactly like they should be looked after, have a defined lifespan. Have those components been identified? Have they been replaced when they needed to be replaced? Is that an accident waiting to happen? These are all things the, the engineers and staff on the mine need to be aware of in order to look after it and keep it running. Companies have also restructured a lot of late in the effort to save costs and as such have vastly reduced technical capabilities. The large mining houses of days gone by had central workshops and all this very, very specialist skills were centrally located and they could operate on many mines. A lot of that capability has been lost. And a lot of those skills have not been passed over to the, the, the next generation coming in. The skills can be found, but they're mainly found these days in external contractors and consultants. Mining costs have increased. And as I said in the point before, the restructuring has increased the workload on fewer individuals. So they actually don't have time to get to everything they need to get to and spend the quality of time that is required in aging infrastructure. They tend to touch a lot, but don't concentrate too much in one area. And we need to find ways in order to improve the situation. 
Typically, structures are designed for about a 20-year life. Some mines that are currently operating are over 70 years old. Their designers have long since passed. They were designed using old technology. Uh, this is a, a meme I, I'm sure you've all seen on Facebook. But it is actually the situation in which we're facing. The generation of um, employees and engineers coming in now grew up in the computer-aided design era. They have never seen a drawing board being used. All these mine, a lot of these older mines were drawn on drawing boards and using those to calculate and log tables and all the rest to actually do the physical design. They designed and that knowledge of has been lost largely. I mean, that is what 10 to 1, a lot of the older mines were designed on. The other fact we know is production is um, favored in terms of maintenance. However, this is a bit of a counterintuitive thing. If not operating at best efficiency, the loss over time will be far greater than the cost of a repair when you first see a problem. It's that slow puncture again. If you pass a garage or you drive into the garage and pump up a tire, by the time you've got to the third garage and put more air in, you may as well have stopped and changed the tire. It's exactly the same with preventative maintenance and ongoing maintenance. It needs to be done, else there's going to be a critical failure and the shaft's going to have to close while it's fixed. Then what are you losing? Other situations with the youngsters coming through is that no one has an initial frame of reference of how the shaft should look. A shaft is a high wear and tear environment. There are several wear parts designed into the shaft to be regularly replaced to save the more permanent, permanent structures. Uh, slippers on conveyances is a classic example of this. When last were they checked? When was the thickness taken? Should they be replaced? How do you know when the slippers are gone? We need to educate people and get them aware of it. And on a lot of mines we've seen, we can tell straight away that slippers have not been replaced. A lot of the time, the people, operation staff, don't know what the original mine design capacity was. We've been called out to a few mines and asked to what can be done to increase the capacity of the mine, only to realize that sometime in the past, the skips have been changed out for smaller ones for whatever reason. Um, and the person that did that then got transferred or retired or what have you. And I just got left in. Um, the mine was expecting a, a huge expense to do it. And all they actually needed to do was put in the original skips. We're seeing this more and more. So in order to get shafts running more to what they were intended. We need to know these things. Shaft skills in themselves are very, very niche because there's not a lot of work done in shafts at the moment. So those skills have sort of diluted a lot. They do still exist, but typically not in the mining houses. And also a lack of understanding of the original design criteria. Should the shaft have been wet? Should it have been dry? Um, very often the environment in which you find something has a very large impact on the lifespan of it. Older shafts have also not been designed for new regulations. Now this is an obvious statement, but what does that actually mean? It means that when regulations have changed due to accidents or incidents that happened, in new inspections get regulated and mandated, and the older shafts have, were never designed to make those inspections easy. So as a result, they don't get done, or it's very difficult to do. They You do them as, as a cursory look just to say, yes, now I've checked it, tick a box, when actually you need to get up close and personal with whatever you're looking at. And this also leads to the situations um, Essentially, we need to maintain the environment in order to extend life of shafts and other infrastructure. So the cost. Just as an indication, a new equipped shaft in today's money 
is about one and a half million rand per vertical sunk meter. They are not cheap things. It's, it's the ultimate grudge purchase. Shafts are expensive to install, so we need to look after them. A, a good uh, example is a misaligned sheave, sheave, how it reduces rope life. I mean, you can think of a misaligned sheave in much the same way as the wheels in your car. If you, your alignment is out, your tire life drastically reduces. It's exactly the same, same with a rope. I mean, a typical 40 millimeter rope costs about 600 rand per meter. Now you multiply that through your average gold miners, probably one and a half, 2,000 meters deep. You need two ropes on the underlay and overlay. If you haven't got a Blair multi-rope or a Blair multi-winder, it adds up very, very quickly. If you can replace ropes every three years, great. If you don't look after the rope or something in the system is incorrect and you have to replace the rope every year, it has a large impact on costs. And it's not just the material costs. It comes down to the time to replace the component, the downtime of the shaft, and potentially mine closure if, if it's something major enough happens and it doesn't make financial sense to actually repair it. We need to think of maintenance costs like a dripping tap. At one drip a second, it equates to 86,000 odd drips a day, and it adds up very, very quickly. 28 liters a day, 11,000 liters per year. Maintenance in exactly the same way. If you see something that's wrong and is not optimal, you need to fix it straight away. If you leave it before you blink, it'll be a year down the line and you'll have a much, much bigger expense. So you definitely need to do it little by little as you go along. Just a couple of pictures of things we've seen. This here is in an actual operating shaft that we got asked to inspect. I mean, this is clearly not right. Not only have you lost structural integrity of that member, but you run the risk of that falling down the shaft and doing even further damage. So things like that need to be changed. And, and what we've seen is people, when they come new onto the shaft, see this and they think, oh, no, it's okay, it'll last another year. It's risky. Here you're seeing water in the shaft running down the sidewall. Also not a great situation because steelwork likes being dry. The more water in a shaft, the shorter your steelwork will, will last. And this here is just pictures of new bunt and steelwork going into a, a new shaft that's recently been put in, in the Rustenburg area. And that said, um, the platinum industry is the only well, sector that's actually put in new shafts in recent years. And yeah, for want of a frame of reference, the platinum mines would be a good one, good place to get them. Looking at these pictures, um, I don't know if people can put up their hands and make a comment, but just looking at this, how many things can you see that's wrong? I don't think we set up for that. But the, straight away, you can see probably at two, possibly three. First one is a water ring that's leaking. It's putting moisture down the side wall of the shaft. You can see here where salts have been leached out of the, the lining, which isn't great because it reduces the strength of the, the concrete lining. And you can also see here a buildup of dirt in the shaft. Now that's not ideal because dirt attracts moisture and moisture corrodes steelwork faster. Coupled to um, a bacteria that exists in moist, dark environments that actually eats steel. I'm sure you've all seen pictures of the Titanic with almost tears of steel falling down at the depths. It's the same bacteria. It's, it slowly, slowly eats the steelwork away and drastically shortens its life. Okay, common oversights and shortcomings. Water rings. When was last were they checked and cleared? When last were buntons cleared of dirt? Uh, I've spoken about the importance of that. 
Inspections are required by law, but the quality of said inspections is not. Very often people just go down and say, yeah, check the shaft, tick, all in order. That needs to be expanded on, because if you don't expand on it, you won't be able to generate trend analysis and all the rest of the inspections. Comprehensively check winder systems in terms of safety systems and the like. Don't just do a cursory check and tick a box. We, we really need to look at the detail. Not many people have experience in shafts. They don't know what they don't know. And, and a lot of skills have left mining houses. Um, and again, there, there's a water ring that's got a blockage. It's leaking into the shaft. And straight below that, there's a bunt and landing, which is wet and guaranteed to be corroding. Now, how can we pick up issues in a shaft and get them fixed? Well, we've all got five senses by listening, by people traveling up and down the shaft in the cage every day. If they hear a new sound, they must report it. Uh, we all know that in our cars, if one day we hear a new sound, something's not right. Murphy says when something changes, it's typically not in your favor. We need to know what it is and fix it. Same with the sound of tipping in the headgear. If one day there's a different sound, go and investigate. It's the mind telling you something has changed. Use that to your advantage. We can feel vibrations and winders, vibrations and bearings, temperature on bearings, knocks in the cage. All these things are indicating different aspects of the mind. And that, as, I, as I said, it's the mind talking to you. You can use your smell. You can smell when something is rubbing, when there's too much heat, friction, sight, what can we see? Just by walking up to a shaft while it's hoisting, just by the whips and the rope you see, you can tell what's happening in the shaft. For example, if a rope whips on the way when a conveyance is traveling up the shaft, it indicates that at that point, the, the shaft is too tight. If it whips on the way down, it means the, sh the shaft is out of alignment at that spot. And now these tips and tricks have largely been lost and we need to get them back into the industry. Taste, oh, that one I wouldn't recommend at all. So what's good practice to actually help you maintain a shaft and know where things are going wrong? Um, for starters, you need to clearly mark things. During shaft inspections, if you see an issue on a Bunton set, if it's not clearly marked, you, you battle to figure out exactly which one it is. You need to keep a centralized, detailed log of audits to ensure that when staff leave or retire or what have you, they don't take valuable historical information with them. You can also then start developing trend analysis and go back a year in the life of the shaft and see what was happening. And you might in that way pick up a potential issue. Include junior staff as part of the inspection team. And not just engineers, banksmen, winder drivers, engineers, onsetters. Involve as many people as possible that regularly use the shaft. I mean, it might be good for a winder driver to actually go down the shaft and, and see it from a different perspective. I mean, them, when they, they're driving, they would feel it on the winder when the shaft gets tighter. It might be nice for them to see it from the other point of view and they would also then be more in tune with what the equipment is telling them. I know Amre has regular visits to different mines, but this needs to be done more often. Uh, during morning safety meetings, ask what new events or sounds people have been hearing. As I've said before, a new sound me means something has changed. What has changed? Investigate. And invite other people from other mines, consultants, suppliers, Leverage external experience and expertise as much as possible. Very often when one person's been in a, on one mine for an extended period of time, they become very familiar and they start missing things. Familiarity, blindness, it is a con it actually does happen. So a fresh pair of eyes might see something that you miss. And you're also learning and sharing information between the two. Um, perhaps one month you go to their mine, they come to yours, you go to a different one. It expands the general knowledge. 
you need to design the inspection team itself so that you're covering as many knowledge areas as possible. Now, a civil engineer is not normally found within a mine staff. However, the shaft lining is something that's also been there for a long time. Is that still in good condition? Yes or no? It might look like it is, but there's telltale signs within the lining that are telling you otherwise. Have you had someone actually look at that? Instead of doing, or oh, you have to do your weekly inspections, but every six months or so, do an in-depth inspection, spend more time, look at it in more depth, increase the quality. Perhaps you can do the top quarter of the shaft one month, and then the next month you do the next quarter down, and so on. But over a certain period of time, make sure you have done an extreme in-depth inspection and investigation and audit of all the steelwork and all the structures and all the mechanics. Identify and eliminate damage causing situations. Look at the environment, water in the shaft, find its source, try and stop it. Generally try and create an environment in which steelwork and other equipment lasts as long as possible. Have a defined inspection checklist and schedule. So tying into the, the extended detailed audits and checks, you can't do them all at once, but over time, make sure you cover all of them. Once you've finished it once through, you start at the beginning again, and so it goes on. I've mentioned inviting guests. Uh, teach everyone, including the, the miners that are going underground about shaft sounds and events and what they mean. Um, the shafts used on a daily basis. The more people you've got listening, looking, feeling, the faster you will and more easily you'll pick up issues and problems in the shaft and you can fix them. Run shaft harmonics tests. Sh running shaft harmonics is it's a relatively new test, but that said, um, old shafts can be aligned and fixed reasonably easily without too terribly much expense. So don't think because you got an old shaft, well, you can't fix that knock, you can. And then identify and regularly check wear parts on a, a stringent register. So in conclusion, as an industry, we need to offer continuous training and education of engineers, foremen and artisans, both to the quality and the safety of the shafts and the, the quality of the, the knowledge within the industry. Possibly start allocating PDP points for specific training and in this way we'll also identify where there's skill gaps. Systems analysis and annual reporting. Again, establishing trend analysis of what's happening in the shaft. Um, if you slowly see something going wrong, you won't pick it up. But if you go a year back in your records and say, oh, wait a minute, something's drastically changed here, it's an indication of something needing attention. And there's also the legal considerations. The 2.13.1 appointee is, is responsible for the quality of the inspections. They should come around maybe once a quarter, once every six months, and actually inspect the records of the inspections and ask questions and just try and get a, more information and, and pass on their knowledge to the, to the 213.3 appointees who are, are physically doing the inspections and, and impart knowledge like that. Create an environment where knowledge can freely flow. Don't be afraid to ask that question. And also move in engineers and other staff between shafts to reduce complacency and increase, increase exposure and to see new things, and just basically a change of scenery is very often as good as a holiday. So, how do you prolong the life of an aging mine? Well, you take care of it, and you maintain it, and you listen to it. It's talking to you on a daily basis. You just gotta learn how to understand what it's telling you. And with that, may you and your mind live a long life, safely, healthily, and, in, and productively. 
Thank you. Um, you can contact us through LinkedIn, just type in the hashtag UMSINT, or our website is umsint.com. Um, any questions? James? Well, well, James, thank you very much for an excellent presentation. It really was good. I wonder if I can maybe start by asking a quick question on this issue of wet versus dry shafts. How do I know what is acceptable and what is not acceptable? And how do I establish a frame of reference for inspection? Well, the, the wet first dry shaft is actually a very interesting um, concept. In Canada and North America, where they've got wooden shafts, they actually purposefully keep shafts wet because the wood needs to be wet else it gets brittle and splinters. In South Africa, our, we used to have wooden shafts and all of those have now been replaced with steel, steel shafts, um, buntons and guides. But steel doesn't like wet shafts. The, the wetter the sh shaft is, the faster the steel corrodes, so we need to keep it dry. And again, that's a good example of the changing technology. As far as frames of reference goes, um, you need to sort of find mines that are younger than yours, mines that have just been installed, and, and try and get on shaft inspections or equipment inspections of those mines. You can actually see how things should be when they're new, and then take that and compare it to your mine and, and, and do a gap analysis like that. Right, well, thanks for that. Okay, now I'm going to work uh, our way through um, questions. Guys, please, if you can fill in any more questions on the Q&A tab on the bottom of your screen. Um, I'll start with the first question is from uh, Bella Mogila Tao. What happens when a, sh when a shaft stands for some time without being used? And wh what is the liable time for a shaft to be left unused? What type of maintenance can be used to put the shaft into a, a usable state? Thank you, Andrew. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can no. hear you, Murray. Great. Um, I'm Murray McNabb. Um, I'm with James on, on uh, answering the questions. Uh, and I'll certainly answer that question, Andrew. Uh, just on the previous question about a wet and a dry shaft, I can give you a quick analogy. This is like taking your new motor car down to the coast, parking it at the beachfront, and letting it uh, sea spray on it all day, and see if you've still got a car in five years' time. You know, you certainly want to keep your shaft dry. Uh, it's going to look like your car will look after a few years. And, and that's, that's the reality of it. Uh, easier said than done. A lot of the shafts are wet. Um, all right, Andrew, your first question uh, to, from the, uh, the audience is, um, how do you, how do you uh, restart a shaft after it's been standing for a while? Um, well, there's a couple of processes to go through, but, you know, the... the a shaft, once it's licensed by the inspector of mines, it's, uh, it gets an MD1 license, uh, which is displayed in the engine room of all the hoists that are allowed licensed to operate in that shaft. And effectively, then the shaft is licensed. The license never expires. It does not have an expiry date on it, and you don't have to renew it. So technically, if the MD1 is up on the board uh, in the engine, displayed in the engine room, you have a licensed shaft, and you may use it. Um, However, there are some conditions. Uh, there's many regulations that stipulate what inspections have to be done weekly or daily, weekly, monthly, six monthly, annually, etc. And if those are out of date, your shaft is not licensed. You, you have an unlicensed shaft. So to re to re uh, instate your own license, and you can do that as the engineer is you simply got to get everything up to date. And one recommends that you first start with the hoist and the rope. Um, to, to make sure those inspections are done. And it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation because um, you've got to run through the shaft to do that. And you can't run through the shaft unless you've done a shaft inspection in the last uh, 10 days. That's what the law says. So you're then forced to do a shaft examination before you can actually run through the and do your full rope examination. Um, not many people want to be putting themselves on top of an inspection platform if they don't know the rope is very healthy that they're standing attached to. So, um, you know, you need to be uh, pretty uh, um, systematic about how you do it. But there is also one other regulation which a lot of people forget about, and we've seen it a lot after shaft accidents where we've been called to. Uh, there's a regulation that says if the shaft has stood for an hour, or the hoist has stood for an hour, the winding engine driver must run it through the shaft from top to bottom, 
and then have the conveyance inspected for damage before you can use that conveyance. And the reason for this is very simply, if something has fallen in the shaft in the last hour, and nobody was in that shaft to hear it, um, you know, you will you make sure that it's, it's safe to do so. So, you know, your shaft doesn't have to stand for a year before you, you actually have to go through a process of recommissioning it. You've got to, you know, as, as, as little as an hour, you have to actually do something to inspect. So I hope that answers it. What type of maintenance can be used to put the shaft into usable state? Um, I think I've gone through most of them. It's the hoist, the ropes, the sheaves, uh, the, the uh, shaft itself, uh, to make sure that the compartments are free, and then obviously the conveyance as well. Well, thanks, Mary, for that comprehensive answer. Um, the next question moving along comes from George Dillis. Um, in terms of shaft maintenance, oops. Um, is the majority outsourced to external providers? Um, maintenance is uh, mostly done in-house. Uh, it's only um, specialized shaft repair work that we are seeing generally being outsourced. And, and, and even that up to five years ago was done in-house. Um, we do get asked to come in and uh, assist with uh, special shaft examinations after an incident or an accident quite frequently. And we get asked to help with rescues as well. So um, maintenance is generally, it's, it's advisable to have in-house in teams. What we have uh, seen on many of the uh, shafts that we've been invited to um, is that uh, the and James, you know, spoke quite a, quite a bit about it in the presentation, is that the uh, skill levels of the people maintaining these shafts are uh, probably not what they used to be five years ago and 10 years ago, definitely. And, um, and actually, it's not the individual's fault. Yeah, we, we just, you know, we found that they're just not trained um, and they're just not mentored uh, as they used to be. So we have been asked to do a lot of that as well, you know, training and mentoring. Uh, with with uh, young crews and teams uh, to to just sort of uh, give them the the, the experience of uh, you know very experienced shaft people and quite frankly uh, uh, you know when I was an engineer I thought I knew it all when I was uh, qualified and uh, it was only about ten years later that I realised I actually knew nothing and all my foremen and artisans were actually teaching me how to maintain a shaft. Um, and, and a lot of engineers are today put in that position where they're expected to know it all. They come straight out of, uh, out of college or university and, and got their government ticket and uh, they get put on a shaft. And then they said, have fun. You know, here's your appointment and make sure the shaft is maintained. And if he's fortunate, he's got a very strong team around him that will actually teach him. And if he's teachable, he'll learn very quickly. But, um, you know, it's amazing how many people are, are just thrown in the deep end and asked to, to sink or swim. The shaft is a very expensive item and you certainly wouldn't want an apprentice mechanic working on your Porsche um, who hadn't been trained properly and brought up to speed. It's going to cost you a lot of money in the long run. Um, and, and, you know, I liken the shaft to a Porsche. It is a very expensive item in the mine. It took years to put in and if, you, if it goes down, it costs you a lot of money each month. So, um, you know, the little bit of money spent on training is good money spent. Great, thanks for that. Um, just a quick reminder here for the, those that are copying the questions in the chat box, please can you copy and paste them in the question uh, and answer section. Okay, the question and answer is now becoming a little bit um, interesting in terms of the latest posts are now coming to the top. <laughs> so people like Gary Lane, if I can ask you to be patient, we will get to you. Um, <laughs> if I can now move on to a question from one of the ladies, Tanya, good evening. Um, are there any existing technologies we can leverage to assist um, with shaft inspection? So 3D scanning has come in uh, quite, quite uh, uh, recently. And uh, there are shafts now being inspected uh, with 3D scanning. And then 3D scanning software can compare any changes from the previous scan. I don't advise you do this on your part of your weekly exam. That's not what I'm advising at all. But that technology is available. Certainly on older shafts where there are areas that are of great concern and typically the lower part of the shaft has received the most amount of water and corrosion. Uh, and we typically see loading boxes and um, you know, up to the last level and below, uh, you know, having serious uh, corrosion problems. 
And if you're uh, worried about those areas, maybe just spend the money on 3D scanning those areas or the areas that you are concerned about. Concrete uh, decay and, and um, you know, movement is, is uh, also being, being monitored that way. And certainly if you are robbing your shaft pillar or mining your shaft pillar, it's very advisable to do 3D scanning on a weekly basis. Thank you, Murray. Um, the next question has a little bit of an overlap to the, the first question, so I don't think we need to, to try and answer it again, but I'll just run through the whole question. What new technology is available for ongoing shaft inspections and directing repairs? So uh, surely you okay. should be doing things differently. Design mm. should consider full life operational requirements, including maintenance. Shaft exams can be done by a camera mounted on the conveyances, and that's as a question. Yeah. So uh, we are seeing all of that being introduced. We are seeing cameras introduced all over. Uh, we are seeing continuous monitoring with uh, decelerometers um, to, to uh, measure uh, movements, especially where shaft pillars are being mined. Um, and you know the, these technologies all require a skilled human beings to interpret them and, and, and to action them and do them. So yes, by all means, go for all the new technology. Uh, continuous road monitoring is something that's mandatory in Australia um, and, and hardly ever used here. You know, most mining houses will do it once every six months, but rope tells you a lot about the shaft. You know, the rope life tells you a lot about the shaft, but also the forces on your conveyances tells you a lot about the shaft as well. Um, and where I have seen this, this technology being applied, I've seen people don't understand the, how to interpret it. Um, maybe they're just not trained, maybe it's just uh, skills that have been lost. So yes, put all this technology in, but you know, make sure you stay up to date and interpreting and using it. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is from Gary Lane. As you indicated, all our shafts have been under-inspected and maintained. This has often been uh, the case due to cash flow pressures and mine survival. How do we fix this in a particular way that eliminates this risk at the same time does within the cash constrained uh, environment? Are you able to demonstrate the ROI return on investment for each type of maintenance? So uh, let me answer that. The, the, there's a couple of questions in that question. Gary, thank you for that. Um, so under inspection is, uh, is, a, is a factor of production pressure 90% of the time. It's not normally a, a factor of engineers just don't want to get around to doing it or engineering staff aren't there. Um, and so production pressure is, uh, you know, negotiated almost uh, on behalf of the engineer, how much time you'll get in the shaft to maintain it. Uh, so typically he will, uh, if he's a very good negotiator, or his pre predecessor was a good negotiator, he'll inherit four hours a week for shaft exam and you'll, you might inherit uh, four hours a week for uh, winder exams. And uh, so you might get eight hours a week. Uh, some of them aren't very good negotiators and they get negotiated into a Sunday to do that. Uh, rope exams are once a month, you know, he'll get neg negotiated into evening shift or night shift if he's not uh, on top of his game. But uh, what I'm trying to stress here is uh, it's, it all requires time. So your new shaft requires obviously less time your older shafts require more time and your very old shafts require much more time. Um, and so Gary's quite right. We, we see that they're, they're mostly under, um, under inspected. That's not the big concern. The big concern is, uh, you know, maintenance time. So when you see that a bunton or a divider needs to be replaced or a pipe column needs to be replaced, um, the capital cost is normally uh, an issue in the beginning. But then uh, very often we'll get to the shaft where the pipe has fallen down, but the brand new shaft uh, column is, is lying on the bank. It's been there for two years um, because they just couldn't negotiate shaft time. The production pressure just was so high. So I think uh, it's, it's really a case of, um, you know, horses for horses. You need more maintenance time. You need uh, somehow to push back on production. And, and, and negotiate that time, eventually you get it because the shaft is now standing. Um, if you leave it long enough, uh, the shaft will, will actually eventually shut down for you to fix it. Um, are you able to demonstrate the rate of investment or each type of maintenance or rate of return? 
Um, the best way of, of uh, demonstrating that is uh, to run the risk scenarios. Um, so should the, uh, you know, Bunton or the guide come off the brackets or off the uh, cleats, uh, what is the scenario? Loss of life is obviously the worst case scenario. Um, you know, downtime is, is the next. And you can easily run those uh, calculations as to what they would be. Loss of life, you could probably bank on a section 54, two weeks, shut the whole shaft down. Um, you know, if you then shut down and you have an inspection and you're told to fix it before, well, that could be two months. Um, so it's really uh, running the, the risk scenarios to get the calculation on old shafts. Um, you know, the rate of return on, on new shafts is, is a much simpler calculation and it's a pure mathematical calculation. But in terms of operating shafts, it's not, and it's, you know, what risk can you take and afford? Loss of life today is just not an option anymore. And so uh, people generally take it quite seriously. And um, the picture that Jane showed where the web is missing on the, on the divider or bunton, I'm not sure what that one was, um, is, is a very tricky one because probably 80% uh, of the audience operating old mines would say that was actually one of their better buntons or guides in the lower part of the shaft. You know, the lower part of the shaft, uh, yeah, thank you. So, so the, the, the interpretation of that then as well, simply put, uh, my whole shaft looks like that from, you know, three quarters of the way down. Um, and it's not dangerous because it's been like that for two years or three years or five years. That's, that's dicing with death because um, the forces on, on the shaft, um, you, ne you need to say if that shaft was running at uh, conveyances at 18 meters a second, it, it wouldn't last very long. It'll come down the shaft. So what, what the trade-off then happens is people start to trade off and say, it's going to cost me so much money to replace these. I'll gear my winder down to five meters a second. In other words, I'll drop back to a third of the production, et cetera. And that way we'll make, make it work. Um, you know, if, if the, the mine allows you to do that, great. But when you start to see this type of thing happening, the, the, the key is to start the replacement early. Effectively, you can work on one button set on a Sunday. It's not a big, you know, how do you eat an elephant? It's just one bite at a time. If you plan it out to say, We'll moil out a set or we'll loosen a set on one Sunday. We'll replace it on the next Sunday. And, and you pick your, your worst 20 sets. You know, within six months, your shaft is, is back to, to perfect condition. You know? um, if you've got 50 sets, well, then you're into a year of it. Or you might have to do two, day, you know, two sets on a, on a Saturday and a Sunday. But it's, it's really about identifying uh, the risks and then scheduling uh, the maintenance around those risks. I hope I've answered that question. Yes, thank you very much for that. Um, the next question is from Lucius Vilu, um, which has a little bit of an overlap. So um, I think let's just um, rather worry about the, the, the nuances as opposed to what we've already covered. Why does production often overpower prudent maintenance practices? Through annual maintenance programs, though annual maintenance programs are set up and signed off once production starts lagging, for whatever reason, maintenance schedules start being compromised. It starts skipping a week or so and deferring jobs. This practice seems to be difficult to remove from mining culture. Okay, um, so the bottom line here is production is king. And, and that's generally why production overrules uh, maintenance and engineering. And you can't blame the sectional engineer for this. Um, you know, generally, the sectional engineer should be raising his hand. If he's a 213-1, he should be putting up his hand and going to the 213. Uh, sorry, if he's a 213-3, he should be going to the 213-1 and saying, I need help with this. And I need your muscle and power to negotiate more time for me. If that doesn't work, he's got to go to the 3-1 appointment. And if that doesn't work, he goes to the 4-1 appointment. If that doesn't work, he ends up at the inspector. But to turn around and say, I didn't get time to do this, is not your honor while you're standing in the dock. I killed 60 people when my conveyance went down the shaft. Um, it's not going to actually win you any browning points in the court. So you've got to, as an engineer, understand your responsibilities very, very well. 
um, and understand that you are maintaining an extremely, extremely important piece of machinery and equipment and uh, the shaft is just part of that and, um, and take it seriously. Um, and, you know, the, the law book has been written in blood. Almost every regulation there, you know, you can't say I'll skip this this week and I'll skip shaft exam. You know, it's been written there for a very, very good reason. So my, my advice is, um, yes, production is king and you need to, as an engineer, put up your hand and get the help you need. It's there. The, the, the appointments are above you to help you with these legal requirements. Great. Thank you. Moving along, um, the next question is from Akimbi. Would you recommend a peer review inspection where colleagues from the same group swap places inspect each other's shafts on a regular basis, perhaps to reduce complacency? Absolutely. Absolutely. A fresh pair of eyes and ears picks up new things. It's a cross-pollination of experience. It's a brilliant thing. And junior engineers should be getting, you know, this exposure. They should be going to different shafts, old shafts, as James mentioned, new shafts, um, you know, ventilation shafts, uh, all of these different types of shafts, uh, combined shafts with brattice walls in them. Get to understand how all of these uh, configurations work. But certainly a fresh burial eyes and ears, brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. I recommend it. Thank you. Robert Kherson. With the benefit of hindsight, is sinking a single drop vertical shaft for about two and a half thousand meters a good idea? <laughs> Robert, um, uh, I, I, I laugh about this because the, the depth of the shaft is not the, the, the issue. The, the, and I think I know why Robert's asking this question. It's, it's um, you know, you need to, you can either get down there with two shafts. I think this is what Robert's getting to. You can get down there with two shafts or you can get down there with one shaft of 2,500 meters. Generally, all these decisions are taken away up front during the feasibility study uh, phase. And generally, the uh, NPV and the RR calculations to tell you what shaft you're going to have. So from an economic point of view, it normally is 2,500 meter drop or a 3,000 meter drop is normally what the, the calculation is gonna show you is the best solution. From an operating point of view, um, every time you have a changeover, it's a loss in efficiency and uh, production. Um, and, and from a cost point of view, the deeper shafts, you know, each one of them, if you change a rope, a 2,500 meter rope, it's a big hit every time. It's a very expensive operation. But generally speaking, the, the less changeovers you have, the more efficient is the operation. And, um, and the speeds in the shaft can increase uh, with, the, uh, with the longer shafts because the acceleration and deceleration time is the same, whether it's a short shaft or a long shaft, generally the same. Um, but you can operate up to 18 meters a second um, in these big shafts. And the shorter shafts, you can't even get up to those speeds and you're already decelerating. So uh, yes, it's courses for horses, Robert. I'm, I'm not gonna try and say this, you know, one size fits all. But uh, generally, it's driven by economics. Thank you, Mary. I think we're going to try and move on to the last two or three questions now. Um, the next one is from Pamela. Are there special shaft exam procedures for shafts undergoing shaft extraction, especially when the shaft barrel is at risk of movement, in terms of best practice as well as by law and legislation? Yeah, look, this is the most dangerous part of, uh, of, of a shaft's life is when you take out the, um, um, or when you, when you have, have movement in the shaft. Um, you know, we, we, we rely on the integrity of the, of the concrete lining to, to uh, provide safety uh, means of protecting people rather safely uh, from scaling and sidewall etc. And that's not, uh, you know, that's not uh, only what concrete is designed for. It's also designed to save electricity. In other words, the uh, smoothness of the shaft, the downcast air, if it's a downcast shaft, is um, you have less turbulence, etc. So there's a lot of reasons why we concrete line our shafts. But concrete lining only has a certain strength. Um, and certainly in, in the South African mines, typically the concrete is only 300 millimeters thick, 12 inches in the old days. Um, and 
you know, if you go into, into mines that are mining potash and, and the likes, you know, you can have concrete lining of four meters thick and they still have concrete rupture, um, shaft rupture. So geo, uh, the geotechnical aspects of concrete lining um, is very misunderstood. But if you have a fracture, shaft uh, concrete fracturing, it's a very, very serious thing. Um, and I mean, I don't need to tell you that if a chunk of concrete, you know, weighing 50 kilograms or 500 kilograms goes down the shaft and you're in a conveyance coming up the shaft, uh, it's not going to end well. Um, and yes, there is technology to measure this. Um, so shaft cracks, for example, you can put strain gauges in across the shaft cracks and measure whether that crack is actually, you know, a structural crack. Um, a lot of the shafts uh, had cracks in them just from the concrete that when it was put in, it was too hot at the time and, and it cracked while it was curing and it's been there forever. So you need to understand what's caused that crack. Um, a lot of the, the times we see um, that if you look at the mine plan, um, especially on the older shafts, they haven't uh, declared that they're mining the shaft pillar, but they've started to eat into the shaft pillar and beg, does everyone know what their shaft pillar design is. Your meters was originally allowed for your shaft pillar and obviously it will increase at depth but you need to understand what is it and you need to look at the mine plans and then see where are these guys mining and, uh, and understand what your mining friends are actually doing in the vicinity of the shaft if it's not you. Um, but generally speaking uh, it's, it's, a, it's a serious thing if you have a structural crack in the shaft because what then happens is you can have you can have a bump or a, a seismic event and your misalignment in the shaft. Now that's a completely different thing. James spoke about us putting in a shaft, um, a shaft tower to allow them to mine out the shaft pillow. Um, and this, this was at Evander number eight shaft. Um, and so we stripped out all the steel work. Uh, we didn't actually strip out all the steel work. We stripped out some of the steel work and we uh, removed the, you know, we, we separated the buntons from the sidewall after putting in cross bracing and we, we built a composite tower. And this allows gradual misalignment over an 80 meter distance of travel through the shaft or 100 meter. Um, and obviously you, you also lower the speed of your winding winder through that point. And so you treat uh, misalignment um, to, to stop you having a, a, a shaft accident in the shaft uh, with your conveyances. So um, you have spear guides and it's, there's a whole process that you go about, but shaft misalignment or shaft structural cracks must be taken very seriously. I did mention earlier that you can do uh, 3D scanning of, of shafts to, to actually get a, a reference. If you suspect that there's movement, you can come back a week later and scan it again. They're relatively cheap, these things these days. To buy one is, is not that cheap, but to have it done is relatively cheap. Um, and, and take it seriously is my advice. Thank you. Um, I think we're going to try two or three more questions. And then what we might do is try some live questions. So I'll just sort of warn Murray in advance. It just depends how we go with time. Um, the next question is from Dimitri Godine. There are always a number of small and bigger issues in a shaft. How you decide if it needs an immediate refurbishment or can, or can it stand for another year? <laughs> a good question, Dimitri. Um, look, if your shaft hasn't got any issues, then um, you're very, very lucky. I think uh, just about any shaft that's past its 10-year mark, and certainly if it's got to its 20-year mark, has got issues. And if it hasn't had something fall down the shaft, you know, it's usually a, a maintenance issue. That's that's. But I think. The, it comes down to scheduling, budgeting, costing, and project uh, management uh, to, to you know, decide what is your priority items. It's certainly anything that, com that uh, can, can cause uh, an accident to the shaft is clearly an, uh, an issue. So what can cause an accident to the shaft? Uh, and in, you know, what are you trying to maintain? Anything close to the conveyances is a priority. Um, because it just has to move out whatever that clearance of your conveyance is, 50 millimeters, and you've got a conveyance, uh, or you've got a ripped open conveyance if it's coming up. Um, then, then the sidewall issues, any, any services in the shaft uh, that are, are um, either corroded or 
come loose or are loose, um, you know, you need to rank that in itself as, as a category, and I'll call that a category, category B, because it, most of those services have got a bit more space to move before they'll obstruct the conveyance. But if the point is going to fall down a shaft, that's a major issue. Um, we've seen services fall down the shaft many, many times, and we've had to repair them and deal with them. Um, and usually it was in the logbook, you know, going back two years or three years and, and just never got time to get to it. So, um, Demetria, it's hard for me to answer your question as to say what's an A, B, C, D, but come up with your own definition of what you think that is and then rank it according to that and then decide which, which areas require um, your, your urgent attention. But here's uh, the caveat. If you are unhappy with anything in the shaft as an engineer, you have the right to stop the shaft. And no amount of jumping up and screaming from production people can make you open that shaft. And so if you're not getting uh, your maintenance time and you're not getting people to take you seriously and you genuinely are losing sleep at night, you should have stopped that shaft. And, and I think that's the point that uh, a lot of engineers just you know, get to. And they do one of two things. Uh, if they're not getting hurt, they resign and leave the industry and we've seen that happen. Or two, they end up in court. You know, they've got to fix it. It's got to be fixed straight away. Thank you. Thank you. Um, moving along now to Mishak Matetua, in your view, are the industry standards that govern periods when should vertical shafts uh, underground major service or overall just like as a practice with practice mining equipment? No, there isn't, Andrew. That's the scary part. So um, each, it's case by case basis. And, um, and most people that get into a shaft every single day have no idea what the condition of that shaft is. They're relying on the engineer and the maintenance staff to actually do what has to be done. Um, and, and my advice is very, you know, don't let it get to the point that you now need a major overhaul or a major rebuild on it. You just keep it ticking over. So, you know, as something gets damaged, fix it. As something gets uh, corroded, start a program of replacing it. Um, and, and you won't have to get to the point where you have to have a major service or a major overhaul. Um, where we do see these major services and major overhauls happening is where shafts are being gradually wound down. So they're reaching the end of their life. And, um, and then, the, you know, the engineers are, are kind of just nursing it along and, and they know that it's going to be shut down or closed at some point. Um, that's probably the most hazardous time to be the engineer on the shaft. But anyway, where the, the major rebuilds in that come in is when the geologist finds another piece of ground to mine and it extends the life of the mine by five years or 10 years. Now they have no choice. Now they have to first upgrade and then they can get to that uh, mining of that ground. And that's the only time we normally see a major service or major overhaul happening. This shaft pillar extraction that we've just come from, that shaft has reached the end of its life. Uh, taking out the pillar, the pillar is an extremely um, profitable business for them. And they did the maths and calculated that they had to refurbish almost three quarters of that shaft so that they could get the shaft pillar out. And that wasn't planned, um, you know, but it, it then turned out that it was worthwhile taking that pillar out after they'd done samples. It was almost a major refurbishment or major service. Great. And then the last two, um, Darius Mumer. Is there any legislation on maintenance of mining shafts in southern African countries? Oh, absolutely. There's lots of it. Um, it's it's uh, usually um, specified in time. So once a week you'll do, once a month you'll do that. Um, and so there is legislation, quite strong legislation around it. Um, and it's it's not just the shaft. It's it's the whole shaft system. So it's it's sheaves, headgears tips, loading boxes, uh, conveyances, uh, ropes, winders, uh, electrical, et cetera, et cetera. There's a, whole, there's a whole lot of regulations written around that. And South Africa is one of the countries with probably the thickest law book. Uh, and I've worked in many, many countries around the world. Um, and and it is a leader in, in, um, in writing regulations around it. Most of the rest of the world kind of follows South Africa. 
there are some nuances with uh, hoists being different in other parts of the world and ropes, rope strengths and rope calculations being different, but generally uh, South Africa is a leader. So if you know the South African legislations, uh, you're pretty uh, on top of your game. Thank you. Um, the last question is from an anonymous attendee. If you're developing through MAL, which is constantly moving, would you recommend more concrete or a bypass tower? Sure. Not an easy uh, uh, um, question to answer. So the closest I have to reference to this is, is uh, potash mining. And uh, they typically uh, potash, the way it was deposited, it was uh, sedimentary deposits, mostly salts. And uh, above it is still very young, young uh, geology, you know, in terms of the life, life of, of the earth. And uh, this stuff is very, very unstable and moves a lot. There's a lot of movement in it and it swells as well. Um, and if, you're, uh, if you have a look at the failures, the shaft failures um, in potash mines, and you can Google it, um, there's some catastrophic ones. Um, and so they try and deal with it in many different ways. They uh, try and first uh, you know, strengthen the concrete. And that's where I spoke about four meter thick concrete, um, reinforced um, and, and try and treat the problem like that. The other one is they put composite shafts in. So it's concrete plus very thick steel up to you know, 100 millimeter thick uh, and even thicker uh, steel segments are put in the shaft um, so, so that it tries to, to uh, stop movement. But, it, you know, just try and think who's strong enough to stop a fall of ground or, a, or an earthquake. You know, that's what you're talking about. You, you know, you, you can't get the, the strength to always deal with that. Um, so shaft towers uh, allows movement to take place. Um, but uh, you can't just see the tower as the only um, solution here. You've got to stop, uh, obviously, anything falling down the shaft. So it's a combination of the two. But shaft towers generally are used where you think you're going to have movement and you can predict what that movement is and you design for that movement. Um, and shaft towers can go anywhere from 50 meters long to 150 meters long in the shaft. Um, because you could expect a, a, a whole meter misalignment of your shaft. Um, so, so shaft towers have their place. There's no silver bullet for this, um, Mr. Anonymous. And uh, I certainly say that it's, uh, there's an, a number of trade-off studies to be done around the costing, the, the timing, the scheduling, and obviously the rate of return on that uh, investment. Uh, generally, we see uh, shaft towers were coming in to mine shaft pillars at the end of the mine. Some of the mines these days are actually pre-mining the shaft pillar out right at the very beginning. So that uh, they then put in a shaft tower as part of the equipping of the shaft. And uh, so you preempt the movement, you allow the movement to take place, and then you, uh, you deal with it through a tower. But uh, the tower then allows for further movement to take place. And these are all, all um, um, modeled out modeled out and, and designed accordingly. So I think there is, there is ways of dealing with this uh, very, very um, positively um, and, and certainly would be willing to, to you know, take it up with anyone that wants any further assistance with that, Andrew. Great. Well, thank you. I think that, that ends the first formal question answer session, which is all written. Um, we do have one hand up. So if possible, we'd now see if we get our Zoom technology to allow us to um, have some open questions. So whoever's got their hand up, can you please um, come online and ask your question? Hi, can you hear me, Andrew? Yes, I can hear you. Right. Uh, it's Alec Gumbi here. Uh, my question is directed to... Uh, um, the presenters, I'd like to know with the importance of um, uh, good shaft maintenance and inspection, do they as a company, and obviously an expert at um, uh, these things, do they <coughs> offer any short courses for uh, people to enroll and go through? Um, I can answer that, uh, Andrew. 
Jim? Go ahead. So the, uh, if I understand it correctly, the first one, what is the importance of shaft maintenance? No, I just, I just said bearing in mind the importance okay. of shaft maintenance. Do you offer yeah. courses? We, at this point, we don't offer courses. Uh, this is something that we have been toying with and a lot of people have approached us to offer these courses. And uh, we've got a lot of material drawn up um, that's historically with uh, individuals in our business and within the business. And uh, because this question keeps coming up more and more, we certainly are going to do that. We're going to draw up some uh, training material and offer these courses probably within the next 12 months or so we will be offering but at right now we don't what we do offer is to go out to the mines and spend uh, time with the engineers um, to to understand what their knowledge uh, base is and uh, and to do some coaching with them as well that we do offer right now on an individual basis all right thank you are there any more questions Well, sure. Guys, thank you. This has been a very productive 70 minutes. A big thank you to both James and Murray. Um, you've had a lot of air time, so I'm sure you're ready for a glass of wine. Uh, on behalf of the Janusburg branch of the SIMM, I'd like to thank you. And um, there won't be a, a live webinar next month. We're having an annual general meeting, so the next live webinar will take place in August. Thank you very much for your time and attendance. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you to the audience for giving us your time. Much appreciated. Thank you from me as well. And if you've got further questions, please don't hesitate to contact us either via LinkedIn or our website, and we will definitely get back to you. Thank you.